Okay, let's do it. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Welcome to you, whoever you are, new person, long-time listener, or anywhere in between. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. How are you holding up? And it's okay if you're not, <laughs> or if it's just barely. You know, I was thinking about how in years past, I would hear someone say, oh, it gets really hard around the holiday times, or this time of year, they would say. And I would often sort of scoff at that because I have a thing about holidays. The holidays haven't meant a lot to me necessarily in my life. My family was never big on them. I always wonder why we, we treat these days as special and all the other days as they're not or whatever. So I've always had like a little bit of a I don't know, a thing about holidays. So when people say, oh, holiday time is so stressful, I'm always like, whatever, all of life is stressful, not anymore on holidays. But, you know, recently, if you've been listening, you know, I've been really on this animism versus materialism <laughs> inquiry, and I've been spending a lot more time tuning into what feels to me like the rhythms and pulses of nature more than I have in the past. And I was feeling this turn into the darkness and thinking, oh yeah, this, this time of year is challenging for that reason, for the, the subtle qualities that we might experience, whether it's conscious or not, in this turn of the cycle, there's a, a a feeling of going into the darkness. And I think a little bit of heightened mm, concern or feeling like you got to make sure you got enough walnuts stored so you can get through the winter <laughs> or something like that. And for myself personally, I'm feeling just a little bit disoriented because... I've created this cocoon for myself, a creative cocoon while I'm producing these video modules for my teacher training that starts in January. And my wife, bless her soul, she knows me well enough to know that when I have a creative project like this on the table and I've got some deadlines I need to meet, I need to create this cocoon and I need to disappear for a while into it. And she lets me in. I love her so much for doing that. But I'll disappear into this cocoon for hours and hours while I'm working and making, and then I'll come out of the cocoon back into this normal mundane of getting our daughters onto school in the morning on time. And it's this really jarring oscillation between feeling deeply connected to life in a beautiful, profound way that feels like a a song of the universe <laughs> and then coming back into this more consensual reality zone where I'm dealing with health insurance companies and all of this other turmoil and division and fear and so it's, it's, it's such a paradoxical swing that I find myself going through. And I imagine many of you as well, because you spend time in practice space, right? You get yourself tuned into a certain frequency and you find a certain space with the people that you're practicing with, or even just in yourself. And then the outside world hits you, you know, at one point or another. And, and the ability to keep that sense of our spirit and soul and animate universe and also navigate what seems to me to be some really misguided ideas about life that are completely ruling our societies. 
It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, right? But I always try to remind myself that life is going to continue to unfold regardless of any struggling or worrying on my part. So I can likely continue doing everything that I'm doing without struggling and worrying so much, <laughs> at least in theory. And you know what? And this is, this is the bottom line for me. Despite all all of the horrors that are before us. There is still so much more to be celebrated than feared. And I'm feeling pretty darn good about that stance. If that feels like something that you agree with and you want to spend a year getting yourself very deeply rooted in that and coming to understand what your yoga practice is for... I would encourage you to inquire about my teacher training program that I'd mentioned is starting in January. We did some info sessions a few weeks back. We are doing another round of those info sessions on December 6th. But if you go to jbrownyoga.com slash training and fill out the three question application, I can also send you the recording from the info sessions that we did, as well as further information about the program. I'm excited about it. I am utilizing it for my own continued study. I mentioned in the last few weeks that this is the first teacher training that I've done in many years now, at least in a more formalized way. I've been doing one-to-one -one mentorships over the last few years, but to put something together in a more... I don't know, organized and formatted way like this has been a while. And I'm comparing what I was doing back in like 2011 and 2012 and all those years when I was really in my full peak of doing teacher trainings to what is happening now and really seeing the vast paradigm shifts. For years, I've been talking about this paradigm shift in yoga. Well, let me say, we are shifted, y'all, because things that I was doing and teaching in terms of deeper study of yoga, you know, 10 years ago, compared to now, we've come a long way. And I am feeling excited about continuing to flesh out what is the future direction, where do we feel like we need to go in what we're doing as yoga practitioners and teachers? And in what ways might we put our energies forth to actually move in that direction and not just say that's the direction we want to go? So I don't know if that means anything to any of you, but if it is, do feel welcome to inquire. Go to jbrownyoga.com slash training. Now, Speaking of getting together to create healing fields, my guest today is Lauren Walker. And Lauren was on the show some years back. She has a new book that is soon to be released, currently on pre-order called The Energy to Heal. And Lauren is an energy medicine practitioner. She studied with Donna Eden. We talked all about that the last time she was here. And I encourage you to go back and listen to that. But today, we continue our conversation. First, with some stuff about Rod Stryker and the para-yoga community. I know I said I wasn't really going to keep talking about that, but it came up again. So... We spent a little bit of time on that because there are reasons why I feel like we need to. But then we moved on from there and got to some of these questions of animism and of the work that Lauren's doing with energy. And I found the conversation very stimulating and inspiring. And if you do too, you can participate in this eight month course with Lauren. Basically her book is on pre-sale right now. And if you go pre-order, you are then able to participate in this course just for the cost of the book. No, no other money, just the 
pre-order, you get to do this eight-month course leading up to when the book will actually be out and in your hands. And I don't know, I really appreciate what Lauren's driving at. And I was excited to connect with her in this conversation. And I'm very happy to be sharing it with you today. Real quick before we get to it, let me throw a little love at some premium podcast subscribers. I want to thank Donna Imbrunone and Anna Marie Webb. Thank you, Donna and Anna. And all of the other premium subscribers out there, we really appreciate you making that gesture of support. If you are someone who has listen to the majority of the most recent 52 episodes on the free feed and you want to get access to the other 250 in the archives or maybe you want to show some support and help us keep this boat afloat, you can do that by becoming a podcast premium subscriber. It's choose your rate. You can cancel at any time. If you're listening to this and you want to get to those old episodes and you don't have any money, just email us and we will definitely give you a free account. But if you're in a position to give a little bit of something, it makes a difference and we're very grateful to everyone who does that. To learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber, the teacher training I mentioned, or any of my other ongoing live stream classes and teacher meetings, everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, y'all, I think that's good. I will touch base with you on the other side for a moment, but let's go ahead and get to it. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Lauren Walker. Hello, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Jay. How's it going? It's going okay, all things considered. <laughs> it's true. You got to consider all things these days. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I often make that little statement there just because I feel like I've got to give myself a little room to hedge these days just in case, you know. A- absolutely, absolutely. But you're healthy and well and your family's healthy and well? Yes, actually, in those regards, I couldn't be more blessed and grateful. Yes, everybody in my house is doing well and I'm fine. So good, good. You know, how about you? How are you doing? I'm doing well as as well. Um, there's been a few, you know, little bumps along the road, but all things considered, just like you said, um, feeling really blessed and grateful. And even when things are difficult, feeling grateful that I have the support and resources that I need to get through them. So yeah, just a in in a in a month of gratitude, in a month of gratitude, in a year and lifetime of gratitude. So it's kind of where I try to hang out. Isn't that true? What you said though, like the support and resources around you to get through it, is it's the key, right? It's the key. It absolutely is the key. It absolutely is. Yeah, because life is bountiful and abundant in both directions in the blessings and the bliss and the gratitude and in the challenges and the difficulties. And so we've got to have tools. That's really, it's all about the recovery. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Lauren, this first moments with you like this, make it abundantly clear that I was really needing to talk to you. (laughs) And, and, you know, it's interesting. We spoke in June of 2019. Is that when we spoke last? Okay. That was like whatever, five, six months before the world fell apart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had been thinking about you recently quite a bit and we will get to this today because I, I don't know. I've really been going through a bit of evolution personally and I've been really into this concept of new animism. I don't know if you've heard that term before. It's like a very academic term, perhaps, I guess. I've heard it. And I listened to a fair amount of the last podcast you did where you spoke extensively about it. So I kind of brushed up a little bit more on where you're hanging out these days. Yes. Well, the reason I was thinking about you before you emailed me was because I remembered and I reflected back to our conversation. And I remember this moment where I, 
I, I made a joke and it wasn't, it was like just kind of having fun, but it was about like the spinning energy vortexes. <laughs> and I, cause I think in the moment I did a thing where I, I don't know, I have like a little something in me where for a lot of years, I believe that I've just been concerned that if I really expressed my experiences and what I know to be true, people would think I was like flaky or crazy. (laughs) (laughs) And so I think I developed all these defenses around that. So I want to ensure that everybody thinks I'm like this totally pragmatic guy that doesn't talk bullshit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, as I've said before in this show, I actually know there to be truth in unicorns and rainbows. (laughs) And I've been just coming into feeling more confident around that. And I will add that I've been kind of, I don't know, shocked in a way to realize how many people in the yoga world hold a very materialist view of things. And I've often sort of derided like the, the mainstreaming of yoga that like, you know, the capitalism has just like ripped the soul or whatever out of it. But in certain ways, it's, it's even deeper than that, that it is about a way of looking at the world and the earth and, and the, the phenomena around us. And I remember you talking about if I, I'm, if I don't know if I've got this right, but you were, you like spend time with some kind of survivalist guy in the woods. And, <laughs> and I just, mm-hmm. you were a person who jumped into my mind as someone who saw the world in this more animist way. And those are the kind of the people I want to talk to you right now. <laughs> so that was the, the reason why I had already been thinking about reaching out to you. Now we're going to definitely get to that. Okay. I'm already, I'm like on the edge of my seat with it. it, it I know, because I know it, you're, it goes you in all there. These, it goes in all these directions. It goes into, into the, the natural world and into the scientific world. And I know you kind of, I know that's the edge you'd like to ride to. So I'm excited to, to see where we're going to go today. So. And we are definitely going to spend most of our time there because that's what I am most interested in. Good. However, yet again, I find myself in this situation I was here just a few weeks ago when Kristen Leal was on, where we have this mutual friend who, you know, has been involved in the para yoga community for a long time. In fact, I just heard from her today, and I believe that she has officially like resigned from the the organization now. Mm -hmm. Yes, like officially. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I I've been in touch with a few people about it, and they at first really wanted to come on and talk about it. I feel like people wanted everyone to learn from this, you know, Mm -hmm. and then they've reconsidered. And I totally understand why on some level, I don't even want to talk about this anymore. (laughs) I feel like we've had the conversation so many times Mm -hmm. yet. I also know in order for us to really give, give ourselves to these new ways of engaging yoga together, these new relationships between teachers and students we really do have to reconcile these histories. And so I feel like I don't want to just move on if there's still stuff that needs to be reconciled. And I know that this is still really pressing for a lot of people. And I've spoken to some people who were totally shocked by the revelations. And then, you know, I spoke to someone like Kristen a few weeks back ago who said she wasn't so surprised. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned in your email that you have some connection maybe in the past to Rod Stryker and the Perioga community. So I feel I'm I'm curious to ask you what that connection was and where what your views are on what's been happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a uh, it's thorny for sure, um, and I am no longer. I mean, I never was certified in that. Um, in that in that work i'm not a certified para yoga teacher but i did study with rod for many many years and that was many years ago but he was definitely a formative influence on me um, as a yoga student and as a yoga teacher i took many trainings with him many teacher trainings with him um and i left 
that community about a decade ago um, because of my own just, I, I had a lot of uh, wonderful experiences and a lot of negative experiences. And, um, and I, and I left because I just, that's, I had a lot of negative experiences in the yoga world at large. And this was just another kind of nail in the coffin. Like, this is not what I want to be doing. I want to be in the lane of joy and of healing and of community and heart centered generosity and openness and healing was kind of my primary thing there. And so I was not surprised actually about this. What I was surprised at is after these revelations came to light, there was, you know, it's kind of been radio silence now. I think um, there's a lot of, of kind of waiting for maybe another shoe to drop. And I do know that there are things in the works. Other people are working on projects of bringing their stories to light about what has gone on in this community. Um, but I... Um, so I, I wasn't I wasn't surprised, but what I was surprised about when this all came out is how many other people had had incredibly toxic and negative experiences in the community. Because when I had left, I thought, as many people do who have these experiences, like it, it was me. It was just me. I couldn't hack it. I wasn't whatever enough, and I, um, you know, and I was just an isolated incident. And when this all came to light, it was very clear that uh, my experience was not an isolated incident, that there was a lot of people that really had quite toxic experiences. And, um, and so there was a, a sense of relief in a way that, you know, I wasn't crazy, just like, you know, you had sort of said before, you don't want to seem like the crazy one. And it was like, I, I wasn't crazy. It was real. I, I really, I wasn't being, um, you know, hypersensitive or, you know, all of those things that you can sort of think that you are like, it was this the right thing. I knew it was the right thing to do. And, you know, my feeling right now, I mean, I have a lot of feelings around it and I've processed, you know, I, as I said, I haven't been in the community for a long time, so I've had time to process this, but what it brought up was really an overwhelming feeling of disappointment. Like, I think that's the, the crux piece of it. And for me, to bring it back to the sort of fractal nature of the universe, which it's funny, I'm looking at your picture, not of you, but the picture that you have is, I don't know, it's your avatar or something, and it's a fractal picture. And, and that's the, the universe is fractal, right? Like, as above, so below, which is what the yoga world is too. And so there's a lot of he said, she said. What we can really anchor into is what Rod himself said, which is that he had this inappropriate relationship and he lied about it for three years. He tried to cover it up, sweep it under the rug and lied about it. He lied to his teacher. He lied to his students. He lied to his family. And the only reason that it came out is because this letter that this victim had written was leaked and then it all came out. And then there's all of this, you know, what's going to happen now? And you know, if that's where a teacher stands, like they're trying to sort of get away with something, that really just speaks to their, their integrity just as a human being, let alone as a teacher who claims to be in this lineage that is this, you know, paragon of how to be in the world. Like all of that collapses like a house of cards, right? That all collapses in the face of this, if this lying, if all it is is that, and that's all we have the exact in his words that he did, right? Let alone everything else that's coming out that's, that can be through that lens of who said what. But we know what he said that he did. And to me, that's enough. Like, that's enough. What he admitted to is enough that uh, he, in, in my opinion, I don't want to study with him anymore. Not that I have anyway, right? But, uh, and I don't want to send any, I would never send a student to him. I would never put somebody in a position to study with a teacher like that. But here's the piece that takes it out of just this, the mud of what's going on in this particular community at the moment, is this profound disappointment with this idea of the divine masculine. Now, I'm not saying that Rod Stryker is the divine masculine in any sense of the word, and, and he put himself into the guru position. We can talk about the toxicity of the guru um, lineage tradition and all of the damage that that has done. 
But anyone that's in a position of leadership and power the way he was takes the role of this divine masculine energy. That's what that role is. It's the, the guide, the supporter, the protector. That's the, that, you know, him being a male also took the role of father figure, which I know that he did for many, many students. Many students, you know, gave him their gold to hold. And this is how he held it. It's devastating. And we see this all over the world today in spiritual traditions, religious traditions, in um, po politics, in um, uh, commerce, and just everywhere. That this idea of this divine masculine energy that is supposed to protect and caretake is doing the exact opposite. It is a destructive tendency. It is the bastardization of this divine masculine, and it's destroying the planet. It's destroying the fabric of social relationships. It's very, very destructive as above, so below. It's also destructive internally. I mean, he, for him personally, he destroyed and ripped apart his family. And who knows what he's going through personally at the moment. But it's incredibly destructive to have that kind of... Um, of fall. And we see it all through society right now. And I think it's something that is really important to examine, to see what has motivated that divine fall and how to rectify it so that we can come into balance. You know, a lot of people talk about the rise of the divine feminine, and I'm all for that, but there must be a balance. The, 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 the rise of the divine feminine can't happen in a vacuum. It must rise with the divine masculine to create the divine union. And that is the path towards healing in ourselves individually. We must heal our trauma, whatever that is. And then we have to do that at large in our, in our world. Otherwise, we're not going to make it. We're just, we're, we're at a precipice. And so I think that this is a really instructive event that's going on right now. It's like, ripping the blinders off. And my hope really is that there is some real examination. I'm, I'm not seeing that yet. I haven't seen that yet. I've participated in some of the um, kind of conversations about what's going to happen in this particular community moving forward. Um, and, and we see that in the world at large too, right? We see like, oh, I'm going to make amends. I'm going to change. I'm going to do better. You know, like we had this big climate summit, right? And now there's the U.S. is selling yeah, these yeah. massive oil Biggest and gas Biggest leasing of the lands right. way what's in right. ever history, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so you're saying one thing and you're doing something else. That is a disconnect. That is a lack of integrity. That is destructive. Mm. So there, that's my, that's my piece on it all. Well, I mean, you, you went... It, See, you made the connection that I was kind of making in my mind between why we should talk about Rod at all and what I really want to talk about, mm -hmm. because it is this reversal where like the divine, we put the divine masculine in, 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 at the helm of the ship mm -hmm. and it should be the other way around. Like, <laughs> but mm -hmm. that's maybe getting a little bit ahead of us because I do think that uh, the one little bit of a uh, discussion I think I want to have about Rod is that I have also witnessed that sometimes there's there's sort of a thing where some people put teachers up on pedestals and others do not. And some teachers let themselves be put up on pedestals more than mm -hmm. others. Surely, as you said, like him embracing a lineage tradition that has already a long history of those hierarchies is kind of problematic in and of itself. And a long history of abuse as well. Yes. Let's just, let's say That's that true. straight up. Yes. That's absolutely true. It, it, mm. All of them, <laughs> all of them. All of them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of them. Now, at the same time, I've also witnessed times where I feel like sometimes, maybe not in this instance, but certainly occasions where I've seen it, that there's sort of like unreasonable standards put on, on teachers. And that's mm -hmm. why, especially with social media and stuff, they, they so fail at dealing it with it when it comes out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems to me in this instance, I know other people who've been in some of these meetings that there are always people like I talked with Kristen and she, she had a positive experience with Rod, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to discount that. And she was very, I think, 
right and good at acknowledging that that doesn't mean that others didn't have it. Mm -hmm. And she did acknowledge that she did, wasn't feeling comfortable now, like you said, mm -hmm. once this even in the absence of knowing what happened, just what you do know on the face of mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. is enough to uh, create a loss of trust mm -hmm. uh, in that person, in that organization. I guess I, my, yeah, my question ahead. to you is this, is that I read that letter that was written that kind of exposed it all. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly one form of power abuse. And that's mm -hmm. where my teacher failed as well. Mm -hmm. And that... I really do think to me, there's a, a need for boundary setting there that I want to hold the teacher responsible for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at the same time, there's also like the toxic experiences that people have within these communities that are just like shaming and people yelling at people in class <laughs> and other kinds of like uh, abuse, not that same kind of like boundary crossing in terms of relationships or in uh, that kind of teacher-student boundary crossing that happens. Mm -hmm. So I guess because you mentioned that you had direct experience, the question in my mind is always, is, is there some sort of pattern here in terms of him, uh, uh, this teacher basically trying to get students into bed with them or whatever? And, and really, it isn't even just that. Like, I'm okay with them being people and wanting to get into bed with people. It's when they kind of use their position and their teachings and their stature in a way that's clearly manipulative. I guess in your experience, um, was, it, was that a pattern of behavior in him? And is there other teachings that you learn from the Perry Yuga community that you benefited from? Well, so this is what's so confusing about when something like this happens is because Rod is an incredible teacher. He is an incredible teacher. I learned incredibly powerful things from him. I mean, he is an, an amazing teacher. That must be said. And um, which makes it so much more devastating and so much more confusing for so many people when this sort of behavior comes out as well. So in terms of the pattern of his sexual predatoriness, I, um, I mean, that was not my situation with him at all. And so I can't speak to that at all. Um, and others that others may, that may come out. I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. I can speak to, um, you know, uh, just patterns of sort of toxic behavior, I think manipulative behavior, um, because I witnessed it uh, and experienced it personally, hand, you know, firsthand. So, so and, and because as, as I said, a lot of that came out when the story first came out of people saying, you know, oh, I didn't even realize that that was abusive behavior because he was my teacher and I just thought that's how it goes, right? And so, it becomes very confusing to have a teacher that gives you these drops of wisdom, these drops of nectar, and then on the other hand, you witness or experience these incredibly devastating um, moments, let's just say, of, of not good, right? Of not good. With the, with, the, with the good, there's the bad, right? And I think... You know, you, you're a yoga teacher as well. Here is the, the stumbling block. You're up in front of a room full of students and they're adoring you. And they're like baby birds with their beaks open, like feed me. And you feeding them what you've learned, what you're experienced, what your wisdom body is. And you're giving that and teaching that because that's your dharma. And they think that's you. And if you are not really grounded and understanding your own ego and your own motivations, and you're not really secure in yourself, then you can take that devotion and that um, transference and start to think that you are all that, that you are this thing that you're not, that you are this paragon or this guru or this lineage holder and all of this stuff that's really... Like, I've got to just say it. It's bullshit. Yes. You are a vessel. You are a channel for the teachings. And if you don't have your own being in integrity, 
then you are really at risk of all the kind of abusive behaviors that we see in the yoga world. I try very hard because I had this experience very early on in my yoga teachings. I was a young yoga student, a young yoga teacher. I had this very wealthy benefactor who built me this incredible studio, organic vegetarian restaurant. I was like the spiritual head of this whole thing. I was so young. I didn't really know anything. And I had this moment of truth where I saw myself playing this role and I was horrified. And at that moment, I took myself off. I took my bindi off. I took myself off the pedestal. I took myself off of that projective place that is, it's juicy. That's the problem. It's juicy. Everyone's telling you, you're so amazing. You're so great. And it's juicy. We want to hear that. Like in anything you do, you know, you play great, you know, you score the goal. Everyone's like, you're great. You know, you, you, you're in the, the school play and you have the lead. You're amazing. Like we want to hear that validation. And yet in the spiritual world, it is very, very, it can be very damaging. And it's, it's very, um, it's fragile because your relationship with your students is one of service. Just like, again, this fractal nature, this, I don't want to talk about politics, but you're, as a politician, you're there to serve. This is what we're forgetting. As a teacher, you're there to serve. I'm not there to serve myself and my own ego. I'm there to serve you as a student. What do you need? What's next on your path? Not my path. That's me and my private time. And so, my goal is always to empower my students. I don't want them to look to me for the knowledge. I want them to look within. That's the Satguru. That's the true teachings. That's, you know, yoga is one of the lineages that offers you a direct connection to the divine. You don't need any mitigating factor. You don't need a priest. You don't need a rabbi. You don't need anyone telling you that this is how to get to God. You have the direct line to God. So you don't need a yoga teacher saying, here's your special guru mantra, and this is going to get you to God. You don't need that. All you need is a teacher that will help you clear what Ram Das used to say, clear the mirror, clear the mirror, just clear the mirror. So you do your practices, and I'm going to show you some because I know a few more than you don't. I'm going to show you some pranayamas. I'm going to show you some meditation techniques. I'm going to show you some asana because I'm me. I'm going to show you a lot of energy techniques, right? And I'm going to help you clear the mirror so that you are empowered. Because ultimately, I've said this from day one, I want to work myself out of a job. I want you to be your own guru. That's the sat guru. That's the true guru. The true teacher is within. And that's not lip service. That is actually the truth. And so I think that if you're not really grounded, if you want to, you know, be this big shirach, or, you know, the big whatever, then this is what's going to happen. Pride goeth before the fall, you know, and that's not what this path is about. This path of being a teacher is about service. It's not about making money. It's not about, you know, headlining festivals. It's not about that. It's about being of service. And the best juice that you can get back is when a student says, I found it. I've got my path. I'm healing. Thank you for helping me. Not thank you for being that conduit, but thanking, thank you for helping me find that within me that already existed that I might have overlooked. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with everything you just said. And, you know, for myself, I just the gifts that yoga gave me were like my healing and reconciling my mom's death and this healing of trauma in me. And that I was so precious to me. I've never wanted to do anything to screw that up. So even at a certain point as a young man, I recognized that there was these issues that you were pointing to. And I wrote this article that was called ethical imperatives and sexually responsible behavior. And it was all about whether or not it's okay for me to date students Mm. because I was like struggling and lonely and tried to date outside of people who were into yoga. And it was a nightmare. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) how do I meet someone? How do I meet a partner in an honest and in a way with integrity? And, and, and is it okay if someone I meet in my class becomes that person for me? Mm -hmm. And if so, how do I do that in a way that's honorable? Mm -hmm. And actually 
my wife read that article. And I think for some reason prior to that, she thought I was some sort of like player, but I was really not. (laughs) And after reading that, she thought differently of me. And and in any case, we ended up being together. We've been together for 20 years now. We have two children and a life together. Beautiful. But I've always been so protective. Mm -hmm. And part of doing this show, of starting this show seven years ago almost, was wanting to make sure that I never fell into that trap. So one of the reasons I do these intros and outros where I'm like hyper transparent and sometimes in the past was like way too much even, (laughs) but was because I wanted to rip down any facades. I wanted people to see that I was just this person who was just fucked up like everybody else, just trying to figure shit out. Yeah, I didn't want anybody to ever put me on a pedestal. Mm-hmm. You know, listen to the podcast enough. It's going to be very hard to put me on a pedestal for some, <laughs> you know, but I think that all of that goes to your initial comment, your initial description, like the idea that all the students are baby birds with their mouths open mm-hmm. and you're dropping the wisdoms in there. Like that is where I think people get drunk with the power mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it yeah. seems to lead to this, mm-hmm. these issues. Um, And, you know, the whole sexual vibe, you know, I think it's really, you know, if you look at all of the sexual abuse in the yoga world, I mean, you know, you've got room full of mostly women and, you know, wearing yoga clothes and, you know, putting their bodies in all of these positions. And you have to be really strong in your integrity to be able to conduct yourself in that class as the teacher, as the, the holder of space for, for people to be incredibly vulnerable, incredibly open. I mean, you're teaching them how to breathe. You're, you're guiding them how to breathe, how to move their bodies, how to move their minds and thoughts, what to think. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you can see why this looks cult-like. And if it's not, if it's not held with absolute reverence and respect in every moment, I mean, it's, it's incredibly destabilizing and it's, and it goes into abuse and we see it over and over and over again. We've seen, I mean, you know, you could just do a quick three word Google search and find hundreds of hits. And we, you know, we all know all the teachers and all the stories of who has fallen from, not even going to say from grace who has fallen and um you know you have to what's what's really awful too i think is um you're supposed to be practicing like as a teacher i practice constantly i'm constantly practicing my life is a practice but i also have a practice on the mat and I practice these things. I practice all the time how to be a better person, how to listen more, how to just all of it. And I'm always just shocked. Like, how could you not? I, 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 I'm shocked. I honestly am just shocked. I don't understand it. I really don't. If you're doing these practices, there's no reason that these things should happen. So that brings me back to why they happen, which I think is unprocessed trauma. I think that's true. I think it's often that. I would also say that some of it is just things that were conventions that have definitely changed. You know, I am getting ready to do a teacher training for the first time in years because I kind of swore them off for a little while. (laughs) And in preparation, I've been going back and watching a video of me doing teacher trainings back in like 2011 to 2015, because I had this video camera that I would put on when I was doing teacher training sessions. And I realized I had all this video still. And a lot of it still holds true, but some of it is very cringy. And in particular, I would do a lot of demonstration, like all the stuff I was teaching about asana is like, I'm, I don't do any of that anymore. And basically it's a, it's me on the floor with my shirt off and all these women standing around me and me demonstrating all this shit to show them how to do it. <laughs> There's a lot and I'm of like, these oh male yoga God. teachers And I was a nice guy. Off. I was really, I wasn't doing any of that other shit. You know what I mean? I was yeah. just honestly trying to teach what I knew. And that's how my teachers did it. And my teachers always said, you have to let people see your body. So I was letting mm-hmm. them see my body. You know what I mean? But it, yeah. when I look back on it now, 
it's totally tweaked. The whole idea of what I was doing mm -hmm. has nothing to do with what I think yoga is really about mm -hmm. in some regards. And the whole, I mean, there's so many of the male yogis that take their shirt off to demonstrate something. And it's just like, I mean, I don't take my shirt off to demonstrate something. I will say this, when I'm demonstrating Nauli and some of the Kriyas, the belly Kriyas, right? I will lift my shirt up so that you can see how the, to draw the belly in, the belly button in towards the spine. I will do that. But you could do that as a man. You could lift your shirt up to show your belly. It's a, you know. I, I have no reason to take my shirt off. <laughs> you have no reason to take your shirt off. At this off. point, yes. I mean, at that time, a lot of what I was doing was about asana and alignment. And if that's what you're doing, you can maybe make the case. But for me, I don't teach that anymore. So there's no reason. And it's interesting that those two things connect. I don't think you can even make the case that for alignment. I mean, what alignment do we need to absolutely see the skin? I mean, we can see you through a t-shirt, your alignment. Yeah, yeah, that's very, true. That's you know. true, that's true. I mean, yeah. if it's a loose fitting, but yes, you're right. I'm, it does, there's no case to be made. It's stupid. Cause I also there's don't no think case. we need to be teaching people poses like that anymore, but that's just me. That Other people yeah. may see it differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but all of that is to say, is there certainly a new conversation around it at, and, and things that I was doing years ago that were just considered the norm and mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. that I would never consider doing now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's good on some level, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I do think that can maybe just bring us in. I mean, unless there's anything else you feel like you need to say about rod and para yoga. I mean, I think that, gosh, I don't know. Anytime there's been, like you said, this kind of dynamic around a person where he considers himself the divine mask. And I mean, maybe that works through people, but when you think of yourself as, you know, what, what do they call him? Um, Nama Rupa or whatever, when you take on Yoga titles Rupa. like that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, as Kristen said, it's kind of, it's baked in that there's, it's going to yeah. get fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, you know, it's sort of like, it's one thing for the students to, you know, put you there. It's another to put yourself there and to, you know, request and require that sort of acquiescence and that devotion. And, um, but you know, the, the other issue as well, it's like, you know, cause I've been thinking a lot about this, you know, what, how do we hold someone to account? What is the path towards, um, towards healing and uh, redemption and all of that? I, you know, I'm not like go away forever, um, kind of person. I do think there needs to be some some real reflection. I don't I don't see that happening now. I don't see that in, you know, if you you look again, this is just what's coming right out of that community. He was taking 3 months off to reflect and er, during that time teaching a retreat in Costa Rica. I mean, it can just make you laugh like that's that's your reflection time like 3 months. I mean, it, it takes three months for you to just realize how the depth and the gravity of this situation, let alone that you're going to find yourself healed and good enough to go and hear you going again. And, but here's the flip side of all that. Cause you know, who is it for, who, who gets to say what that time frame looks like, what that healing curve looks like, but it's like we live in a market ruled world, right? And his retreat in Costa Rica is sold out. So um, people are obviously, many people are not disturbed by this and don't really care and um, are willing to keep teaching, uh, studying with him and pay thousands of dollars to study with him. And they're fine with that. I mean, we see that, you know, you see lots of um, teachers that, teachers I thought would never teach again and they're teaching again and um again I'm not I don't want to name any names because I don't want to bring any spotlight or attention to any of these teachers but again it's a quick google search to see you know former yoga sexual predators who are now teaching right it's crazy um but the market is going to decide whether he is held accountable or is not held accountable that's really um, sadly or not. Maybe that is just how it should go. I mean, I'm not judge and jury in this. So, you know, I, I don't know. I'm disappointed. I would never study with him again, but I made that decision for myself in 2013 and have never looked back. Um, but that's a personal decision that each person needs to make. And a lot of people are just saying, well, he's a great teacher. I'm going to go study with him. 
See, I mean, like you said earlier, it it, it is a a hard thing to reconcile when it's a a, a brilliant teacher who then also has this misgiving, mm-hmm. and it really does go to you know where we started some today because you know the reason why some people maybe don't have a problem with it or reason why even forgetting about if we set aside all the sexual abuse and all those power abuses and we just look at like practice and Mm -hmm. like I was saying about teaching people alignment and making people's bodies into very specific shapes and like that's the right way to do it and if you do Mm -hmm. that then that means something or whatever Mm -hmm. we were doing in years past Mm -hmm. that is rooted in an idea about yoga that isn't what you were saying at the very beginning and it's not rooted in this idea that the the authority or the the wisdom or the knowledge uh it would it comes from like the land and the trees and the <laughs> air and the <laughs> and the like you said our sat guru where we with some tools can learn to get quieter inside and observe these things for ourselves and that again for me like you you described in yourself, that's been like the boon and gift of yoga practice to me is that feeling of, I have an internal source mm-hmm. of truth and wisdom that can guide me. Mm-hmm. And it, it hasn't failed me yet. Like if I do it well, you know, <laughs> if I listen careful enough, it has never done me wrong. And sometimes that idea, I call it intuition. And it's almost like, I hear in a lot of circles, intuition getting a very bad rap. Mm. Like I even saw a post the other day, again, names not mentioned. It said something like intuition equals experience plus bias. Like you can't trust it, you know? If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.